Welcome to the Craftsman Founder Podcast, hosted by Lucas Carlson. Every week, we talk to founders, entrepreneurs, and those who've made a craft out of creating companies and enterprises. Listen every week to get ideas for starting, promoting, and growing your business. There are no shortcuts, just good old-fashioned hard work and craft. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's interview. Hello, this is Lucas Carlson from the Craftsman Founder Podcast. Today we have a really special guest, Patrick Blaskovitz, uh, lean startup guru. This guy has written books that have been New York Times bestsellers uh, about lean startups. He has created lean startups. Uh, He's currently the CEO of Superpowered, which is a lean startup. Uh, And... Uh, we first met because he interviewed me for the the book that he wrote about lean entrepreneurs, uh, and from there we blossomed a friendship. We've been in touch. Uh, he's taught me a lot. He's given me some awesome marketing advice, uh, awesome strategic uh, thinking advice for startups, and uh, it uh, it's a real pleasure for me to have him on the podcast and uh, pick his brain uh, for for us to understand how we can best apply uh, lean entrepreneurship principles to our work uh, and and how to think about marketing uh, in today's day and age. So, Patrick, thank you. Tell us about your background. Sure. Uh, so, first off, thanks for having me. Um, <clears throat> a little bit about my background that's most relevant is I got into startups uh, during the first dot-com uh, uh, bu- uh, bust and bubble, or bubble and bust, rather, in sort of 1999-2000, college, finishing college, and my roommate and I uh, started a really weird startup around embedded Linux, because at the time uh, you didn't have anything like Android, and people weren't uh, people were you know paying incredibly expensive licensing fees to use embedded operating systems. Uh, my roommate, uh, super super talented engineer got a project uh, stripping down Linux uh, to, equate, to create this quasi-embedded uh, system. Uh, this is back in 1999, uh, and, and there's this, there actually a big, um, a lot of interest around that. And so a lot of, a lot of embedded Linux start, companies started uh, then. A lot of Linux companies, pe- people like Red Hat, uh, Monta Vista Software, a bunch of folks. That's when I did my first startup. Uh, we learned a ton, uh, but effectively we were just uh, overgrown children and made a bunch of uh, really uh, rookie mistakes, but uh, but learned, learned a tremendous amount. Um, and then the dot com bust happened, and uh, there's sort of a wasteland, and not a lot of people were doing stuff like no, technology scared a lot of people out, uh, including myself. So I went back to grad school, um, went to Europe for a few years, and actually wasted a lot of time not doing technology projects and trying to do sort of more traditional career path type stuff. Um, which uh, which which never led to sort of the personal attraction and interest and passion that I that I, I wanted to achieve, um, and then I got back in the startup game uh, in uh, around 2008, and got in you know sort of thinking build it and they will come, uh, again sort of classic early founder mistakes try to be all things to all people, um, and uh, that didn't go anywhere, <laughs> no big surprise. I didn't go anywhere, and then at around that time, this, lean, this idea of what a lean startup could be became uh, very popular. And so Steve Blank, uh, he wrote the seminal book, The um, Four Steps of the Epiphany, and then his student, Eric Reese later came out with The Lean Startup, and then Brent Cooper and I wrote a book called The Lean Entrepreneur, where we, we took those ideas uh, and, and really tried to um, uh, create sort of a mainstream format for thinking about them. Uh, as luck would have it, uh, at the same time, interest in technology, innovation, and startups started burgeoning, and so now here we are today, where you know the Wall Street Journal is writing about startups on a daily basis, and that's always been sort of my marker. Where years ago, the Wall Street Journal wasn't dedicating you know acres of page pages uh, to startups, and now you know you see friends and and colleagues quoted all the time, and that to me is a radical shift. Um, and so that's where I'm. For, that's what I you know recently did, and then uh, I've done a few you know pretty interesting web projects. I had a, a site called Paleo Hacks uh, that I just recently sold. Uh, that did pretty well. Uh, it was a very large community and very large email list. We had uh, about two million page views a month, uh, about a million uniques, 
uh, did um, mid six figures revenue on that annually. That did really well. Um, recently sold that to concentrate on superpower, which is what I'm working on now. Wow, that's really cool. And it's it's really awesome that you talk about some of uh, your past struggles and and how you didn't always have lean in mind. You you approach things in a way uh, very common for a lot of our listeners to fall in love with an idea or to fall in love with what you think you should be doing uh, yeah. and and spend a lot of time. And in fact, I don't think there's anything wrong with uh, with doing things that way. You learn a lot. Uh, failure teaches you a lot. But um, yep. how how is superpower different? How are you approaching it differently than than some of the other uh, things? First of all, what does superpower do? Sure. So superpower is a is a, I'm pretty excited about it. It's actually not my idea. It's my my co-founder Gabor's idea. And uh, Gabor, actually, it's funny. Uh, I sort of I think about the, the theme in this in this interview, right? The craftsman founder. Gabor is much more of a craftsman founder than I am, uh, because um, this is a, a a project that emerged out of his passion, um, and then uh, it sort of proved itself. And then now we're taking trying to take a, uh, a step larger. And it, and it came out of Gabor's work as a DJ. So Gabor's an interesting guy. He's a he's a DJ. He's an audiophile, he's an audio engineer, and he's also an assembly coder. Wow. And hey, exactly. And so uh, he's been overclocking um, uh, processors for uh, you know 20 years now. And this started back in the mid-90s where he would overclock like this crappy Celeron that they had so that they could use Fruity Loops to write music, to create music. And um, and the, with his work and you know creating uh, uh, sort of EDM music and things like that, uh, you know, watching the CPU meter, watching CPU usage was like a crucial part of actual music creation for him. So, and when he saw, mo you know, the emergence of serious mobile devices when the first uh, iPhone came out, when the iPad came out, it was very clear to him that DJ software would move to these low-power mobile devices. So he said, thought to himself, well, that's cool. Um, well, why don't I build a cool DJ playing app for the iPhone or for the iPad? thinking that he'd just uh, find an audio engine that could do all the, the heavy lifting and then he'd wrap some sort of UI around it. Right. Well, it turns out that uh, audio engines, there were no audio engines that actually could perform on low power uh, mobile processors very well, right? And uh, he got deeper and deeper into this and, and he was like, holy shit, uh, okay, well, I want to do this. This is, a, this is a, something I'm very passionate about. So he's developed his own audio engine effectively. Uh, that does some very, very complicated things like uh, uh, time stretching and pitch shifting. Um, and from scratch, he developed like uh, algos like FFT that run on these very inexpensive processors and run very efficiently. And so his DJ playing app has done very well. It's got more than a million downloads. Uh, European DJs that actually get paid money to, to DJ at clubs use his app. Uh, sort of like the, I, I call it the industrial strength EDJ app. So it's not you know a 15 year old kid with, who wants to play on turntables. It's actually some guy who actually you know is playing at a bar in Croatia and wants to DJ on his iPad. Uh, and then um, a little bit more than a year ago, Gabor came to me. I just finished the book and, uh, and we, we were meeting up. And uh, he said, "Look, I've got this fundamental, really interesting technology. It's much bigger than this DJ apps. It's really actually uh, it's actually pretty powerful stuff." So I need some help taking to market. I need a hustler, and I also want to think. And he's also had his share of, um, of mistakes and challenges he's done in previous startups. One of those, you know, trying to go big or go home, and you know, build and they will come. Typical, typical stuff. Typical mistakes we all make at some point. And so he goes, "Look, I'd like to take sort of a lean approach to this." Uh, that said, neither neither Gabor nor I are dogmatic about it. The, the point isn't to be a lean startup. The point is to win. That's a, that's a mistake often. Um, folks who are very enthusiastic about lean startup uh, often make, unfortunately. And so, anyway, uh, uh, so Superpowered right now, we have two products out. Uh, one's an, an SDK for audio for iOS that competes directly with Apple's core audio API offering. Wow. Um, and the other one is an SDK uh, for Android. And on the iOS side, uh, we can offer better performance and an easier to use API than. than and core audio, and then on the Android side, it's actually much, perhaps much more interesting because we can solve significant uh, fragmentation problems that developers have on Android when it comes to audio, at least. 
So let's say you're a game developer and you're developing a game for Android, you run into the, these nightmarish fragmentation challenges, uh, and they're even worse uh, for audio. Well, we are effectively a, um, I guess you could call it a middleware in a, in a way, where we can, we're a unifying layer across all Android devices so that when you make a call to the API, you know it's going to work uh, and you know exactly what's going to happen, which today is not the case. Uh, you know, Android development has many challenges today, uh, and um, in audio specific or even trying to do anything uh, around pro audio is virtually impossible. Um, and now there's been a lot of interest by OEMs and system on chip suppliers about how do you solve this uh, low latency problem at Android. Uh, we think we can solve a good portion of it, at least on the software side. There's certain parts of the you know the hardware stack we simply can't uh, reach, so it's going to take a system on chip supplier or an OEM to 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 tackle those parts. But um, everything above the metal uh, in terms of audio processing, we have a pretty pretty good angle on. And so I'm pretty excited about that. That sounds really cool. So when you came in to, to this company, it sounded like he, he had a little bit of the uh, if you build it, they will come sort of mentality. What did you bring to the, the table, and how did you uh, bring lean startup mentality into Superpowered? What, what changed? Uh, what was well, the so before it, and after? It, it's not, that's not quite accurate. So Gabor had already made his mistakes in previous projects. Ah, good. So, so Gabor and I know each other. We've known each other for a while now. And one of the reasons uh, he thought that he and I would be a good fit is because he wanted to do some lean sort of, uh, take a lean approach. So it was, it was hey, I have technology. Um, it's, it's bigger than just simply this DJ app, which is doing fine and doing a great job people love. But this is actually a legitimate technology startup. Um, help me take this to market uh, aggressively, uh, aggressively, but at the same time keeping an eye on uh, a lean approach. Right. So, and how uh, how do you do that? What's your what's your kind of uh, approach to that? So, uh, generally speaking, it's it's you know I think about I think about sort of where our high risk assumptions are, right? About and typically, that's around what's the value we're delivering uh, to any specific customer segment, and then how do we message that? And that's a that's a iterative process. And so, you know, how the value that Superpower brings to a uh, a, uh, let's say a game studio developing for Android is going to be a little bit different than what it uh, brings to, let's say, an indie developer doing um, you know, some cute little app on iOS. And we have, so number one, we have the assumptions about are we actually delivering value? Uh, and then two, how do we message that? Because often I've seen uh, very interesting, very, um, especially very te technical startups, they actually deliver great value, but they do a very poor job messaging it. Uh, often because the founder is uh, uh, very, uh, I hate to say this, but very engineering minded, and they just assume that the value is obvious, right? Like it's obvious what we're doing. It's this, and uh, and and that's part of the curse of knowledge, right? Like we all run into that, um, you know. How to and so uh, we have assumptions around that. We try to test, and and uh, like the other day, I just did. Um, we were speaking to an OEM, and I literally marked down the words they use when they talk about their their problems and how they think about uh, what, what we were what we were offering, right? And this is this is actually nothing. This is not necessarily lean per se. This is like an old marketing trick, right? Listen to the words that uh, your customers are using and then reflect them back uh, upon them, right? Um, but uh, but that's we've done a lot of that and, and actually really, you know of course try to understand the customer segment, try to understand their needs. Um, it's sort How of do you get stuff. over that blind side of being uh, the engineer uh, approach? How how are there any tips or tricks for for overcoming it? You know, it's it's a good question. Um, for me, it was getting you know letting life punch me in the face a few times and realizing I wasn't smarter than everybody, and and watching other people much more talented and, and much smarter than me fail when 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 there was you know you should be using this technology why aren't you using it people are, uh, you know. Uh, I don't know if there's any way to really, um, I don't know if there's really any way to conquer it without actually sort of feeling it, right? I don't think there, there might not be a way to rationally conquer that unless you've actually like made that mistake. Uh, maybe I'll flip it on you. Maybe I'll interview you, Lucas. You're, you're actually an engineer. <laughs> How well, do you? What do you tell engineers about that? Uh, actually, I I just did an interview the other week with Michelle Miller who's uh, an author writing uh, startup novel stuff. 
um, called The Underwriting. Uh, it's in one of the previous podcasts. And she said something I had never thought of before, and I thought it was super interesting. I'd, I, I think that a lot of it has to do with storytelling, and, and I've talked about storytelling a lot. Uh, but she said something that I, I had never thought of before, which is it's not just storytelling about uh, how your customer uses your product. The story has to also include how did they, what was their life coming up to finding your product? How did they come and find your product in the first place? What's that story? And I think a lot of entrepreneurs don't ask that question. They don't even wonder how would somebody off the street, completely random that has never heard of you before, how, does the, how do they come upon you? What's that story? Uh, and uh, understanding the whys, the, the motivations um, uh, of your customer. Uh, and a lot of the time what will happen is if you try to do that, you'll realize, well, I don't know. And, right. and that leads you down a series of questions uh, where you start to question your own assumptions, uh, question how you're approaching marketing it, question uh, the words you're using. I think that um, a very, very simple trick that I learned a while ago was that nobody wants to read uh, facts about your product or service. Nobody wants to read a, a list that says, and we do 4 gigabytes and 12 megahertz, and like nobody, that's, but that's what most people think intuitively, well, that's what they want to, they want to know how fast it is. People don't want to know how fast it is. They want to know what problem it solves. Yep. They don't want to know the features. They want to know, uh, you know, here is what the solution is for. It's not what the solution is. It is here are the problems that this sets out to solve. And usually the story about how people come across and find your product uh, actually comes from people having a problem people in the middle of a crisis. And when they're in that crisis, uh, they look for solutions. When they look for solutions, they stumble upon your product because you were talking about people in crisis, people in having the problem that your product solves, not because people were searching for a 12 megahertz processor. It's because people, uh, you know, my thingamajigger keeps crashing or, what, you know, whatever it is. It's, it's a hair on fire problem. No, it's funny that you say that because uh, we have to, we haven't done any aggressive marketing just yet. I'm I'm sort of a uh, uh, sort of stacking the deck before I, I sort of run my growth hacking bag of tricks. Um, but so but I was actually watching Google Analytics yesterday, and we got a bit of traffic from Stack Overflow uh, um, or Stack Exchange, whatever. I forget. Stack Overflow, yeah. And uh, it was funny. So somebody has downloaded our SDK, and actually, uh, unbeknownst to us. Um, uh, you know, re remarked on it and linked to us in, in a thread that's very applicable, right? And it's about this problem solving, right? These people need some. These people are looking for uh, looking to solve their problems on developing audio uh, intensive apps on iOS and, and Android. And there's this list of our sort of our competition or, 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 or people that do similar things. And there we are as well. And so I was kind of watching that, and it speaks exactly to your point. Like the part of our part of Part of my funnel, whether I like it or not, is going to be uh, forums like Stack Overflow, right? Because that's where developers f first go to solve those problems, right? Whether it's whether they go to just they type in the, the the browser bar and go, or whether they're they're uh, they're just typing in you know FFT in iOS, uh, chances are that Stack Overflow is going to rank really well, and they'll end up there first before they end up on my site. Right? Yep. And, and that's fine. That's and then I just have to adjust for that and, and leverage that. That's exactly right. That's the story about how people uh, stumble upon what you're doing. And, and, and a lot of people uh, don't think about that story, don't wonder about that story, and, and just um, you know, say, well, I'm just going to list the features of my FFT transformation, and, and that, that means people will find it. Right. right. No, no. I've, uh, I made a mistake. It's painful, embarrassing. Uh, and uh, it's it's one thing I I, uh, I say to myself and I say to my sort of my, my friends and partners about this is uh, I've tried making art before for art's sake right art for art's sake and this is definitely not not that we don't want to make art but this it's got to have value it's got to find its intended recipient uh, they have to value it 
Uh, they have to engage with it, and it can't just be uh, a beautiful bust on a shelf, right? It's got to be so, got to be something that really uh, uh, that, that really provides value, and, and, and we also, of course, capture some of that value. Yeah. So, can you give uh, our audience a little bit of coaching about how to find product market fit? It's one of the most common questions I get uh, in the Craftsman Founder blog. Is um, you know, how do you know uh, when you have found it, and uh, how do you go about searching for product market fit? So you're cutting it in and out, but I think you're still there. Um, so good question. Uh, you know, we we wrote it, we actually talked about that uh, in our first book, The Entrepreneur's Got to Customer Development. And uh, as you well know, it's a, it's a uh, term that Mark Andreessen came up with, and then Sean Ellis has done a lot of work around you know uh, trying to measure that signal. The 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 th the thing I would say about it is it's not a static state. It's not like you find it and then, like, all right, my work is done here, and I just sort of move on and cash checks, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a condition of being, and and it can be lost, and you see startups happen all the time, right? Like, they, they look like they're doing well. You're seeing this, you know, up into the right growth, and then uh, a competitor emerges out of nowhere and, you know, undercuts them at the knees, um, and you see, them, you see startups, you know, Lose and regain market product market fit all the time. So the, the the first point being is it's not a binary, irreversible type thing. For some reason, that's that's what people think. Like, oh, I found product market fit. I'm done. Like that's all I got to do. Not only do you have to find it, um, not only do you find it, then you have to like sort of care. You have to do this care and feeding of it, and make sure you maintain it, and then grow it, and then if you and and it's really sort of product market fit per segment, right? And so. I think a lot about segments because I'm sort of a natural marketer. Uh, uh, I hear most people aren't, but uh, so for us, a superpower. Are one of our, um, developing on iOS and Android, and the the I want to get product market fit there. I want a lot of people using uh, our SDK, getting a lot of value from it, you know, talking about it, and then using that to segment. Right, so that could be, for example, let's say game studios, um, or music tech companies, or all, all other sorts of people. Um, and in terms of how to go about finding it, it's it's you know, it's that uh, that magic sort of alignment of aligning the right segment with the right value proposition, the right technology, and the right channel. And if you can align those things, uh, if you can align those things, uh, you are very well positioned to find product market fit, right? And so a lot of folks don't, the mistake I see a lot of engineers do is not think about, like we talked about earlier, the acquisition channel, the story about how they find out about your product, right? So they've got great product, uh, great value, but everything like who that person is and how to find them repeatedly and scalably and how to message them is sort of forgotten, right? And that's a crucial part of that, that, that system of equations. That makes a lot of sense. In fact, that really... Uh, jives with what uh, one of my earlier podcasts with, with Dave Hirsch, founder of Jive, which is a uh, publicly traded company now. Yeah. Um, he spent eight years building Jive before it went public, and uh, I think he said three times uh, did they change direction entirely during that period, and basically they found product market fit three different times, and uh, it was only the third time where it was a company that could go public. The first two or three iterations of the company were businesses. They made money. They were fine businesses, uh, but they weren't were businesses that were probably never going to go public. And if they had s stayed as static and not been searching for anything better, they would have um, uh, never come across the idea that finally. Uh, made them uh, uh, enough revenue to actually go public, and I find that super fascinating. Yeah, I think I think that's a great point. That it's not it's not a one-off binary irreversible thing, right? It's, it's sort of a, this continuous search, uh, and then once you get into it, um, in fact, I have a friend. Uh, they have a very successful startup. It happened uh, where they came upon a business uh, that was actually spitting off cash. Uh, they were very excited for a while uh, because they were literally minting money, but they just saw that it was uh, sort of a limited business. Like they would not be able to grow that business very large, right? In terms of uh, 
what um, you know, venture capitalists would consider very large. And so they actually had to spin that business off and go find product market fit elsewhere because they were aiming for you know, a very large um, you know, an IPO-like exit. Wow. Uh, what do you think are the top three most common mistakes you see founders make? Ooh, that's a good question. Top three. Uh, from my perspective, uh, from my perspective, it's probably uh, it's uh, my perspective. It's probably not being aggressive enough with experimentation. I think there's a. I mean, with the as you well know, uh, you know, sort of the, all the online tools we have today, you can do so much with a few hundred dollars. Uh, and so I actually like to, on all my projects, I like to keep uh, every month we spend a few hundred bucks doing interesting little hacks. Some of them pay off, uh, some of them don't, um, and, uh, but you sort of build an arsenal. And, and I sometimes speak to founders where they, try, they, 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 don't, they don't sort of think like that, and they sort of, uh, for example, I know a guy, uh, he wants to start uh, doing PPC. Uh, so he wants to explore PPC you know, uh, uh, as a channel, and this guy's a very smart and talented guy, but I think he sort of assumes that it's sort of flip your switch and you'll have you know scalable uh, ROI. Uh, I, I don't think that's the case. I don't think it's ever been the case. Uh, so I guess number one mistake: not doing, not being aggressive enough in cheap, low-cost experiments, and just throwing tons, tons and tons. Two, um, yes, yeah, three. That's another one. I see this quite often in early founders uh, or first-time founders: is trying to be all things to all people. Um, and so what's interesting is you'll see a pattern uh, where that you'll see that doesn't work, and then on the next startup, they, you'll see people do some very niche stuff. Right? It's almost it's sort of what I'm doing right now is this audio, uh, this audio space on wearable and mobiles uh, that we're in, that we're excited about. Uh, it's, it's very niche, and not a lot of people understand it. Right? So it's not the typical startup that you find on angel list, right? Which yep. also tells me that when it's time for me to go raise money, angel is probably not a great place for me, right? Because it's probably the wrong media, right? So when I go and raise money, it'll be the um, it'll probably be from angels who understand sort of the semiconductor digital signal processing space. Um, I sort of went off on tangent there. Uh, uh, that was one, two. So try to be all things, all people. Number three. Number three. You got me, Lucas. I don't know. I think I think one or two. Not enough aggressive experiments, and then trying to be all things to all people. I think those are pretty prevalent uh, in, uh, in in in, in uh, early stage startups. It was interesting because um, uh, before those are excellent ones, and the first one you said when you were first saying it, I actually interpreted it to mean something different, and also applicable, but then you turned it into a different point. But the what I thought you were going to say was that um, uh, that people don't people come in with the assumption that they're trying to prove that their startup is a good idea, right? Instead of trying to disprove that it is a good right. idea, right, right, right. Uh, I I I talk to founders every day that. Uh, are trying to pitch me and trying to convince me that, that that's really what they should be doing, uh, and which is fine. You know, there's a place for pitching your idea, but as a founder, there's so especially in the early stages when you are pre 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 product market fit, your job is not to prove that you have the right idea. It's to try to disprove because bad ideas you should be able to disprove quickly. And good ideas, you should have a ton of trouble disproving. You should come up, like what you were saying, you should come up with experiments, not just on different ways to market your idea, but you should experiment different ways to see if you can kill your idea and see if it'll die. Or, you know, the thing is that good ideas are always going to be uh, good ideas, and you can't kill them no matter how hard you try. Uh, and that's, the, that's what you're looking for. But often people try to uh, keep alive bad ideas far longer than they should exist. Uh, right. If they put them on life support. No, absolutely, uh, uh, absolutely. And, and it's funny for me also. I have uh, two children, and uh, and Gabor also has two children, and so it's it's very that also impels us 
to really kill bad ideas and really act fast, right? So, you know, at the end of the day, what's a startup? It's just an exercise in, uh, in resource constraints, right? And there's always more to do and more things that can be done with uh, limited resources. And once you have children, uh, you really feel this much, much more so, right? It's it, yep. even things like, okay, I want to work all night. Well, that's not always, yeah, I'm going to do that a few nights, but I can't just do that every night or uh, not only because I couldn't maintain it, but it's not fair to my wife and my children either. Right, and so once you, once you're in that you're in that situation, you really start thinking about the quality of ideas um, and which ones are worth actually investing, you know, blood, sweat, tears into versus which ones aren't. Yep. So you are a natural marketer, and uh, Andreessen Horowitz uh, has has said many times how important uh, a, a solid marketing go-to-market plan is for a startup, and that uh, they see. Lots of startups come in with great product ideas uh, and no sales or marketing plans. Uh, and that they love to see companies that have uh, solid product and sales and marketing plans. So uh, as a natural marketer, how do people avoid this mistake? How can people um, who aren't natural marketers, what, what can they do to try to uh, strengthen that part of the story? Could you repeat that? You're just cut out what the last ten seconds oh, I missed. Sure. How do uh, how do people that aren't good at marketing uh, improve in marketing so that they can come up with solid marketing plans? So, I actually don't think uh, I don't think that's quite the problem. I think the problem is that a lot of times, um, market sales and marketing are sort of looked down upon as sort of lesser disciplines. And that's a that's a common sort of uh, I would call rookie mistake, right? Because if, if you look at the you know like for example the enterprise software world, there's a reason why the the enterprise sales men and women are making a lot a lot of money, right? Because uh, sales uh, is hard, <laughs> number one, and it, you know moves the ball forward. It's sort of obvious in retrospect, but you know the, the, too often the the stereotypes around car salesmen and things like that are thrown around. Uh, often by engineers, uh, until you actually get an engineer out, out in front of customers, right? Steve Blank talks about getting out of the building. Uh, it can be very frustrating. So there's this understand. There's this thinking that oh, sales and marketing is easy, right? Uh, it, I think uh, it only looks easy. And I think Peter Thiel actually in the Blake Masters notes uh, on Thiel's class, Thiel talks about it. It's one of those things that everybody looks at engineering and goes, oh, engineering is hard. It looks hard. It is hard. Sales, that's easy. And um, on a personal level, my, my father's actually an engineer. He's a civil engineer, but he actually worked. Um, he did some computer work back in the 70s and 80s. Um, and he actually told me, even as when I was at 14, he, and they said, "Hey, you want to you want to go sell?" He's like, "Sales? I'm an engineer. I build bridges. Come on, like this is gonna be easy. Like I do hard work." And then in the real world. Uh, and and that's not to say that uh, that sales and, and marketing are, are more noble than engineering, but it's a it's 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 a crucial part of the the, the company process company processes. A lot of founders sort of uh, poo poo it, don't take it seriously. So it's not a, it's not a what I see more founders. If there's a founder who's a bad marketer, that's I think easy to fix if you're cognizant of that. Right? You say okay, well I'm not a great marketer. I'm going to either find a founder who's a good marketer, or I'm going to hire a good marketer. Or I'll read up on, uh, you know, I'll read Kissmetrics blog daily to learn how to do good online marketing. I'll read, read Neil Patel's blog or what have you. Or there's so many sources out there, right? You, I feel like you can become go from bad marketer to good enough marketer very, very quickly, just if you read the right things and actually take action. But with the the prejudice against sales and marketing is, I think, uh, sort of immature, but unfortunately very prevalent, right? And, and, and that's actually a bigger problem. I'm not quite sure how to fix that. And software, people go, oh, my app didn't go viral. I wonder why it didn't go viral. That was, oh, okay. It turns out, like, the guys like Neil Patel and Sean Ellis, like, turns out those guys know some stuff, and that's why they, you know, that's why they're compensated so well. Yep. And how has marketing changed in the last few years? What's can you can you say in a nutshell what is growth hacking? Is it something? Is it a fad or is it something real? <laughs> so that's funny. So I actually have a talk about growth hacking. Uh, 
So uh, the, the growth hacking, what I think most people misunderstand about growth hacking is that it's not just a series of, or, or a sequence or a collection of cute little hacks, which, which I like and love, by the way. I have you know, uh, tons of them. But I think serious, quote unquote, growth hacking is finding a new channel, finding a new medium for your message. And the, the, when we talk about hockey stick growth or up and to the right, that's actually a lagging indicator of having found a new channel. And uh, actually I actually have a whole talk about this and, and I've written a little bit about it, actually just marketing. So some people say, oh, well, marketing, growth hacking is just marketing rebranded. It's not. Typical um, marketing, uh, it's, 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 it, typical marketing is sort of execution of best practices in known channels, known customers, known price points, known value proposition. Who can ex out execute hacking is like, I'm bringing something new to market. I don't even know how to actually find my customer, right? Uh, but if I can actually exploit or find or hijack the channel and I can create a new channel, a new medium, that I think is true growth hacking. And, and I think if you see, if you look at sort of the history of very successful startups, um, uh, I believe the evidence bears this out. Makes sense. Uh, I really appreciate your time and your thoughts. Uh, before we go, What's next for you? Is there uh, any more projects? Is, is it just focusing on the new company? Yep, right now just just working on Superpowered and uh, going to work ahead of us uh, on that. Uh, a lot of challenges, but uh, so far the signals are very strong. Uh, uh, you know, I'm trying to eat my own dog food on this, uh, but I'm really excited about it. Uh, again, I think we're solving a real problem. Uh, we're doing, you know, validating and, and uh, our assumptions, um, trying to find the right folks. Um, but but that's it. That's super powered, one hundred fifty percent. Great. Well, if they if anybody wants to uh, read uh, Patrick's book, it's the Lean Entrepreneur. I'll have a link on the blog. Uh, New York Times bestseller and um, brilliant guy. Thank you for being on, and I'd love to have you back soon. Great. Thanks, Lucas. Thanks.